session nine of our virtual learning series, Foundations in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy for Social Workers. My name is Heidi Allen. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Associate Professor at Columbia University School of Social Work. Tonight's topic is integrating the psychedelic experience with Dr. Kyle Ortigo. This learning series is brought to you by the Psychedelic Therapy Training Program at Columbia University School of Social Work in partnership with the Penn School of Nursing and with generous funding from the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation and the Joe and Sandy Sandberg Foundation. Thank you so much for being here. Hi everyone, I'm Brooke Stott. I'm the program manager for the Psychedelic Therapy Training Program here at the Columbia School of Social Work. Uh, just a few administrative notes. As a reminder, this series is not intended to be a comprehensive training in providing psychedelic assisted therapy, but to initiate dialogue and start building foundational knowledge in the field of social work. Notably, for the first time, we have a specific pharmacological drug paired with a specific therapy model under review for approval by the FDA. As social workers make up the largest segment of mental health providers in the United States, it's critical that our clients will have access to these emerging innovations in clinical practice. Also to note again, with the exception of ketamine, these therapies are not yet available in the US <clears throat> outside of a research setting. We are bringing you this content with the anticipated FDA rescheduling of MDMA and psilocybin in the coming years. Um, with that, I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Henry McConnell, He's an MSW candidate at Columbia University and a lead organizer in the Student, Caucus, uh, Student Psychedelic Caucus. In his practicum work this year, he has provided ketamine-assisted therapy to a diverse range of over 80 clients. Henry is also a collaborator in the lab of Dr. Mitch Earlywine, where he is researching per, um, perceptions of MDMA-assisted therapy among veterans in the VA system. While his original plan was to become a Zen monk, Henry is excited to build new bridges of healing as a psychedelic therapist and researcher. And with that, I'll hand it over to Henry. Thank you so much, Brooke, Heidi. Hi to everyone out there tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce Kyle Ortigo, PhD, who is a clinical psychologist, certified psychedelic psychotherapist, and founder of the Center for Existential Exploration, where he offers depth-oriented psychotherapy and integration services in Palo Alto and San Francisco. After completing his training at Emory, Stanford, and UCSF-affiliated hospitals, Dr. Ortigo worked at the National Center for PTSD for five years, where he directed a national implementation program that paired telehealth coaching with web-based mental health interventions. Dr. Ortigo has authored several articles and chapters on personality, trauma, diversity, and mental health technology. More recently, he has published two books. The first is Treating Survivors of Child Abuse and Interpersonal Trauma, STAIR Narrative Therapy. Second edition is a co-author, and the second book is Beyond the Narrow Life, a guide for psychedelic integration and existential exploration with a foreword by psychedelic luminary and Johns Hopkins psychologist, Dr. Bill Richards. Beyond the Narrow Life offers a guided journey to explore intersecting interdisciplinary themes involving mythology, existential fears and hopes, and psychospiritual development. The book's activities and meditation support independent exploration, as well as psychedelic psychotherapy. Dr. Ortigo has served on the advisory board of Psychedelic Support, a practitioner directory and training platform, and continues to support public education and professional training by being part of the core training team, a moderator, consultant, and faculty member of the California Institute of Integral Studies, otherwise known as CIIS, Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Research CPTR Certificate Training Program. I hope you will all join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Kyle Ortigo. Thanks so much. Thank you, Henry. And thank you, Brooke and Heidi, for the invitation. I'm excited to speak with you all today. So uh, it's an honor to be invited for this series. I was telling Heidi before we got started just how I really value and um, support public education efforts. And that's exactly what this is, to make it accessible information to people. 
And so I, I also appreciate uh, just starting all my presentations with gratitude because anytime I give a presentation or I'm on a panel, it's not just me that's speaking. It's all the people um, that I have relationships with that I've learned from uh, that have taught me. Uh, I again, want to thank uh, the organizers of this entire series. It's been wonderful. I, I've listened to several talks now that are already out. I'm not going to name all these people, and it's definitely not exhaustive, but people that have been very influential and supportive in my journey of integration and, and writing that book, and just life in general, and included here, all my clients. I can't name them by name, because uh, confidentiality is important, but I learned from each and every one of them. I deeply appreciate that. I also like to highlight, um, just as an example, I was not trained by indigenous people, but the closest lineage from people who've trained me and their influences have been uh, not just from the West, but the Mazatec people. And Maria Sabina's historical decision to open up those sacred mushroom ceremonies to Westerners, unfortunately under false pretense. And there are lots of costs to her and her community because of that. And I appreciated that was part of this series too that we heard from some Mazatec healers um, in that perspective, and I deeply appreciated that. And I love giving PowerPoint presentations because it gives me an excuse to share a lot of art that really speaks to me. And so I wanna thank uh, three artists in particular, Gustavo Otab, who did the book cover, a Brazilian artist, and this is one of his um, pieces in Brazil. I have several of his artwork in this presentation. Lysander Alston Kramer did some of the interior graphics. And then Peter Moorbacher uh, has a wonderful collection uh, called the Angelarium series. And you can go to angelarium.net if you're, if you're interested in that. So anytime that I give a talk related to psychedelics in any way, I think of this image in terms of all the different places that we could go, all the different things that could be said when it comes to psychedelics, psychedelic journeys and their place in healing, transformation, society. And in one of my first talks in this area, one of my mentors gave me the advice and said, you know, Kyle, just shoot a straight arrow. And no matter what path I choose, there are always gonna be some things that are left out and things that I'll just touch upon that we can dive into but that's why we have discussion and Q&A. Um, so this will be my version of a straight arrow this time around. The path of the arrow includes saying a little bit more to situate my perspective in the field in this presentation. I wanna give an overview of the concept of psychedelic integration, including some metaphors. I'd like to talk about some key practices from my personal perspective that support integration work. Give some example resources that are out there already available for folks and then have an open discussion. I will probably pause once or twice during this presentation too to answer any questions that are relatively straightforward or that I need to clarify before going further. So if you have questions, um, it, it doesn't bother me. You can type them up or send them to Henry and then we can see if any of them might be uh, easy enough to answer in the middle of the presentation, but we'll share more and discuss more in depth after it's completed. So one of my favorite titles for an academic paper in all time was uh, Letcher, who is an anthropologist, 2007 paper, Mad Thoughts on Mushrooms. And what Letcher did was try to use Foucault's ideas about discourse and power uh, in applying that to the psychedelic field. And this was well before the boom in the West, the current boom in the West that we've been in for several years now. What is articulated, um, my summary of it is, what can and can't be said and by whom in any given context. And that there are a few assumptions here. What's likely impossible is talking across these different frames of reference and being truly objective. I certainly agree with the second, and this is why science actually as a field exists is because uh, it is very easy uh, to, to be biased and for those biases to show up. Not that science is the only answer to that or has solved that problem. 
So I mentioned this is based on Foucault's model. These are some of those frames of reference and domains that Letcher articulated that are just worth mentioning here. There are debates and conversations, um, quote unquote, experts and quote unquote, lay people in each of these. And the questions are, um, for example, within the pathological frame, whether or not psychedelics are poisonous. When we move into the psychological, it's whether or not and how effective they might be at being a medication for specific conditions, for healing, for psychotherapy. The prohibition frame is whether or not they should be dangerous illicit drugs. Recreational is can they be used reliably for fun and enjoyment. The psychedelic frame is whether or not they're good tools for self-exploration. The entheogenic, which is referencing um, the idea that psychedelics can manifest the God from within, uh, is whether or not psychedelics can be used in that way as sacraments. And then finally, the animistic is whether or not psychedelics can be used for devices for encounters. And this includes some uh, spiritual ideas and indigenous community uh, notions about spirits like the mother ayahuasca as an example, but also includes several other things that you hear in just a quick YouTube search um, for psychedelics. So people experiencing some sort of entity that they may interpret as a fairy, as an alien, interdimensional alien, like all this stuff is, is out there and part of what um, is discussed and debated, but often in different circles. So I generally already break the rules here because I do like to bridge and think it's possible to bridge the psychological and the psychedelic. And, you know, and some of the others as well, but this is really my focus. Even with that, though, I'm still American. I'm a Westerner. I'm male. I'm a psychologist. have been um, for most of my adult life, it, it seems. So these are embedded within my perspective and, and why it's important to be in dialogue. One of the values I really hold and what I think this sort of framework really highlights for us is that there are different roles of science, theory, culture spirituality, art, and we can respect all of them. And because we're, we're all trying to explore uh, the human experience and the experience of consciousness. So now we can get into the core theme. What is integration? Well, the simplest definition that I've ever come across was that integration is what happens after the journey. And although that in many ways may be true, it's not as satisfying of a response. A slightly more technical definition sometimes, and that you all have already heard, is that it's the third phase of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, those three phases being the preparation phase, the medicine experience, and integration. But even that's not quite so simple. This is an example from the MAPS Phase 3 MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy for PTSD Protocol. And what we see here, and I'll decode it for you, is that there are preparation sessions, and then there are three medicine sessions, but interwoven through these sessions are integration sessions. Uh, so there's a cycle of preparation, medicine session, integration, preparation for the next journey while integrating the last, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's how it's going to be for the most part for many people in the real world and already is. My working definition that I, I would continuously update uh, is right now, uh, integration is an ongoing process of translating elements of a psychedelic experience into actions, practices, and or attitudes so that it has a meaningful impact in one's life and ideally one's relationships and community. And I really like to add that last bit. Even as a psychologist, we're all embedded in larger systems. I like this analogy of translation because when translating from one language to another, uh, problems and challenges are to be expected. Some things get lost in translation. That's certainly the case when we think about profound psychedelic experiences that are often ineffable, um, multiple hours long in many of these cases, to our everyday life, everyday sense of self, consensus reality, uh, which may be different than what we experience in a journey. 
And then from there to trying to see if we can apply effectively any insights gained from those experiences. Some of the integration process involves internal changes. So these may be the attitudes, beliefs, emotional experiences, affect, self-concept, identity, as well as external changes. So behavior and one's environment, relationships, major life choices. Another analogy that's pretty common that I also like is that of a tree that uh, psychedelic experience plants a seed that can grow. This is an analogy that's used for a lot of things, including psychotherapy in general. And it's both that the tree can grow, but the roots are deepened too. So it's not just um, growing into the sky, but being grounded as well. I also really like the metaphor of architecture. And I also wanted an excuse to share this beautiful picture of the Pavilion of the Enlightened in Thailand. This is a modern piece. It's, it's not an ancient temple or anything, but the metaphor is that with integration, we're trying to build a cathedral or temple instead of a house of cards. And some of these major powerful psychedelic journeys, not in ordinary states, can lead to a more comprehensive remodel. But some of the smaller ones may be just as meaningful and may be more akin to placing a single brick. So researchers, we like to measure things and we need to measure things when it comes to um, articulating and conceptualizing uh, specific concepts like integration that are more abstract. And this is one paper that I recommend if you're interested in, in that work by Freiman, Whit Whitney, Yaden, and Lipson. And this is one of the measures that they created and tested through a few different studies in that article. And I chose this one, the experience integration scale, which is more focused on the subjective experience. And all these items that I'll, I'll mention were on one factor. So integration on a single factor, the degree to which um, someone was having an experience where their psychedelic journey was integrated into their life. But conceptually, they had three domains. One was a sense of feeling settled. So the highest loading um, correlation on, on the overall score was I feel more balanced since my experience. The harmonized uh, domain was I feel harmony between my daily life and my experience. And the one with the most items that correlated highest was the improved category. I feel the positive effect of the way I interpret my experience. I feel the benefit from my experience expressed in my life. And I feel greater self-awareness since my experience. So that gives us from a different angle an idea of what integration may mean, how it's experienced at least. Some common questions that I receive about integration, um, I just wanna speak to directly. First is, is it necessary? And I would say if psychedelics are to lead to any meaningful change for an individual or society, then yes, some form of integration would be necessary. Otherwise, it's just a, a novel experience that may be really fascinating and cool, but doesn't have any uh, impact. The next one, is it automatic? And I think sometimes, at least in part, it can be. And um, some people have been surprised by that. They thought integration is automatic because it felt as if it was automatic for them. But this is definitely not the case. It's easier for a pre-existing system to stay the same. And when we think about that, that can mean both our internal system, our psyche, as well as our relationships and community world. So there is an importance of more conscious effort too, intention and practice. Another question is, is therapy required? Is integration therapy required? No, it's not required, not for everybody at least, but it can often be very helpful. And in some cases it would be indicated if someone's having a particular tough time with the experience they had, um, which may be the case too, if it was a very positive, uh, typical mystical-like experience that we think about in, in this, this way that's often discussed, that can be hard to integrate to know what to do with when you return to a life that doesn't seem to be quite as aligned to those uh, experiences. Is there a protocol for integration? Not really. 
Okay. It's an individualized process. And uh, we tried to create protocols in modern research and psychotherapy and in the world to try to simplify things, streamline things. Uh, and there's a place for that. And one of the places is to have something to work with and to adjust and to, to make sure that these frameworks are flexible enough. They may work from general principles and outline, but then they're adapted always to the individual because there's a diversity of experiences that people have and lives that people have. So some areas of focus for integration. First, I like to start off, what were the intentions for the psychedelic journey itself? And then ask explicitly, what were the intentions or are the intentions for the integration phase? These may or may not be the same. Uh, oftentimes there is an adjustment to an intentions or the focus of the work after a journey. Some things are clarified, updated, new avenues to explore might be introduced. So that's why you hear the phrase, um, have intention, but hold it lightly. Like I mentioned before, balancing general principles with individual practices is key. So what I'm talking about a lot today is actually some of these general principles. Some intentions are focused on personal growth, some psycho-spiritual development, community engagement or activism. Sometimes it's focused on healing, and this could be in managed care, certainly symptom reduction and management. Sometimes a stabilization. They immediately after a ceremony or experience, there's additional levels of support to reestablish a sense of uh, grounding and consensus reality. Now I have this arrow here because these are not mutually exclusive. You know, it's quite possible that someone starts here at the stabilization, moves towards some uh, more intensive healing, and then ends up in a place of broadening out to, to other um, sense of growth and growth practices in the community. So that's a little bit of a, the overview of the concept. What are some key practices to support integration? Again, from my perspective and experience thus far. There are three broad uh, collection of uh, personal favorites I have to support integration. And a lot of these apply just in depth oriented work in general. The first is some structured or unstructured, but ongoing reflection. Journaling is a great opportunity for this. So after a psychedelic journey, it may be writing the narrative. It may be responding to focused reflection questions. So I do this in my work in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy um, after the material has come up, uh, thinking about how I might frame some of it as a question to stimulate further reflection for the client uh, later in the days be before our next integration session. Sometimes these are things that come up very directly, like the client can uh, form the questions themselves. So all of that's welcome. There's also the opposite approach to just stream of consciousness journaling or writing or even speaking uh, where you just follow where the mind goes. So it's not orchestrated or structured, but you can often come to places that are meaningful and, and helpful to explore. Sometimes it's exploring specific symbols, imagery, uh, sensations that emerged in the non-ordinary state so that it doesn't stay just in this verbal symbolic realm, the cognitive realm. Uh, it's also very helpful to have some embodied practices. Uh, sometimes this includes meditation that includes the body, like breath-focused meditation is great. Compassion, loving kindness meditations are ones that I, I always personally recommend, think are powerful. It may mean doing walks in nature. If uh, connection to nature is a part of the theme, then that's a pretty direct connection to make. Uh, so that's that's one. And then even the basics, right? And that's to respect the mind-body connection. Um, the mind-body connection is how taking any sort of 
substance allows us to get into a different state of consciousness. Not that we necessarily need that, um, like with holotropic breath work, um, but it's respecting the role of the body in our psychology and in our world and our environment. And that includes paying attention to things like nutrition, sleep, exercise. The cultivation of relationships, this may mean working with one's partner, friends, family, working through any rupture and repair work, or even contemplating that, because that's usually a, a long-term process, and deepening the intimacy or the connection with certain people. This is true, too, of one's community, local, and broadening out from the local community. Considering cultural reciprocity, especially in the case where people are having experiences in other cultures or facilitated by indigenous people or traveling, this can be a, a, an important part of this, and that responsibility and giving back. And it also may mean reconnecting to your own personal family history, um, your own personal ancestors and practices that may be more aligned with whatever is emerging uh, for you or the person who's going through an experience where they're realizing that um, there are some practices or some connection with some of their cultures of origin, even hundreds of years back. And so that's to address this sense that um, we have to adopt the practices or uh, perspective of other cultures that don't belong to us and we want to avoid uh, cultural appropriation or any unintentional harm that's done by that. And then last but not least, getting more connected to nature and our relationship with nature and to earth all the way up to the cosmos. And speaking of that, I really love this famous quote by Carl Sagan, who was not coming from a you know religious perspective. He was a Western scientist, but had a poetic way of just articulating uh, our place in the cosmos. For we are the local embodiment of a cosmos grown to self-awareness. We have begun to contemplate our origins, star stuff, pondering the stars, organized assemblages of 10 billion, billion, billion atoms, considering the evolution of atoms, tracing the long journey by which here at least consciousness arose. Our loyalties are to the species and the planet. We speak before the earth. Our obligation to survive is owed not just to ourselves, but also to that cosmos, ancient and vast, from which we spring. So going from the cosmos back down to earth in our efforts to have models and ideas, I have this alternative model for thinking about integration and just practices in general. That is an expansion of some of my work outside of the psychedelic world. And it's using what I call the four modes of experiencing and coping to consider how we might balance these different ways of exploring and integrating experience. So those four modes are thought, the cognitive level, second, emotion, effective level. Third is the body, somatic, and finally, behavior. So an example focus for integration within the cognitive might be adopting meaningful attitudes that were inspired or reaffirmed in a psychedelic journey. This could be the recitation of touchstone statements, positive affirmations. I have this one here, Be Here Now, um, echoing Ram Das and his book as a good way to encapsulate that experience. One caution here though, is that we might inadvertently reinforce intellectualization if we're too cognitive, too verbal. And we also might reinforce uh, reification. And reification is when we take an abstract concept or a working model and we approach it in a very concrete and rigid way that we think that be here now is like the meaning of, of life. I mean, there may be an argument for that, but we do so in a way that's oversimplified and narrow and maybe rigid. So that's worth pointing out here. But I do think this thought and cognitive level is often a part of the integration journey.
emotions. Uh, so increasing emotional awareness is a, a very common one that I've seen and is helpful for all of us to an extent. And for some people, it may be exploring specific emotions and how they're expressed and how we feel like we want to express them in life, what messages they're giving us. Within the somatic domain, it could be a focus on enhancing mind-body wellness. Uh, so yoga is a nice two-for-one because there's a meditative presence-centered part of it. Uh, and there's also the, the use of the body and movement. And I included smoking cessation here too, because it's part of behavioral health. There's evidence-based practices for smoking cessation. It's a huge public health issue. And it feels like so concrete and so simple in theory. But of course, we know in practice, uh, tobacco is, is highly addictive and difficult to um, stop. But this may be part of the message, part of the focus of integration even. So we want to acknowledge that it doesn't have to be all about the cosmos at exclusion of some of these things that feel a lot more grounded and even mundane. The behavior mode may be about establishing healthy routines and habits. And the example, I already mentioned the nature walks, uh, which I like. But another example is anything in line with behavioral activation, which is one of those evidence-based treatments for depression that is really powerful. So focusing on increasing a person's willingness or at least their behavior of getting outside the house, exploring their local environment, and that that's really helpful for recovering from depression and preventing it. So that's another example focus. Now there are many different intersecting domains that I'll just mention um, that may be helpful in conversation with these four modes or certainly independently. That's various levels of the social environment and relationships, one's professional life, Again, nature is coming up a lot and spirituality that aren't quite captured maybe just by these four categories alone. I really value the creative drive and psychotherapy in general and definitely it has a role to play in the integration process. Now this comes even from a place of artistic appreciation or connection to things that already speak to us, whatever form that may be. Uh, I've mentioned several times because it was so foundational to me. I have a, a bit of a film studies background too, and I love film. And so that that's part of my life and that's part of my work. And there are ways that film can help us in, in exploring these concepts and experiences. But it could be art, could be poetry, which I'll talk about later, actually. Uh, one part of this is not just appreciation for appreciation's sake, which is valuable, but also maybe the amplification of any of the mental phenomenon, the emotions, the archetypal material um, that emerges in a psychedelic journey or even spontaneously or in dreams after a journey. And Jung talked about this. It was a big part of Jungian psychotherapy. And then last but not least, creative self-expression. So I'm going to give a couple of examples that have been applied in the psychedelic world. One is mandala or sacred circle drawing, and Jung pointed to this, but this has been incorporated in holotropic breathwork ceremonies uh, for uh, 30, it might be up to, yeah, 40 years now almost uh, for holotropic breathwork. And so mandala drawing is often incorporated in that at the, after a ceremony. And that's one person's example, mandala after a holotropic breathwork ceremony. Another one, might be creating a symbolic altar of some sort, some way to uh, note these nonverbal symbols that uh, are meaningful or important for an individual. Here is an example. And in this person's example, there is a combination of uh, divine feminine energy across different cultures and divine masculine. Also a recognition because of their placement of, of the integration and things beyond gender, right? We can reify gender, certainly. Um, but this is part of how this person wanted to express some of these themes and that these dialectics. And then create a problem solving. So I work with lots of engineers um, and people in, in research, and I've been in those worlds or adjacent to those worlds. And I, I like to point out here 
uh, given the platform, a future problem solving program international that works with kids and adolescents on integrating a structured problem solving focus um, and process with creativity, bringing in brainstorming and seeing that creativity is not just about art, um, which is important and has a role, but can also be an important part of life and an important part of our um, hopefully charting a more mindful course toward the future and solving issues as they arise. So that's a way it can show up even for someone who, who doesn't draw or do alters. Some specific challenges uh, that I'd like to just mention for a client or the journey or one of the big ones is returning to a life not supportive of integration. This is especially common when people are traveling internationally to do a legal journey, ayahuasca, psilocybin, et cetera. And then they come back to America or wherever their home is, and no one has any understanding of what that experience was like for them. So they may just be naive, their, their close relationships or community. Uh, there's one analogy that was given to me years ago that has been very helpful. And it's thinking about someone, even if they have a, a really powerful, positive, um, transformative experience, they're doing the integration work. Uh, they may have a partner who feels like there is a religious conversion that is creating some distance or some incongruence with, with them. So that can be something that can be important to navigate. So facing that a career is misaligned with any of the insights gained or the values that they reaffirmed, that can be a big one. John Wellwood, who was a psychologist, existential clinical psychologist and a Buddhist practitioner, coined the term spiritual bypass uh, to really highlight a process of where we can use uh, things like all is love, be here now, even I referenced that earlier, things that may hold some weight and have some meaning, um, but these spiritual concepts and ideas as a way to kind of skirt over the complexity of life or things that are a little bit more challenging or not quite as simple, uh, where those ideas may be relevant, but they're just used in a bit more of a surface level way to bypass, to skirt over the more challenging aspects of life. I came up with the uh, idea of ego whiplash because I think of like going into these non ordinary states, um, ego death, so so called ego death, and then coming back into everyday life, going to work the next day or a few days later, and then you're you're back to how you have to use your ego to function, and there can be this seemingly paradoxical experience from the quote unquote ego death to this place where there's some inflation. And there may be a part of that that's just temporary and can be expected and natural. That's actually part of some of the process of integration over our time, but it's something to be mindful of because certainly we don't want to reinforce um, narcissism or arrogance or self-importance, right? That's missing our embeddedness. And patience for change is a big one. So jumping too quickly to making major life decisions and of course, uh, we want to balance that with using the energy and any genuine, authentic insights, um, but to plan for it. Being still very focused on outcome, like I wanted my depression cured, or I wanted to not feel sad anymore, whatever it is, to more of a process-oriented perspective of how things are flowing over time and improvement and the nonlinear aspects of improvement the pressure to just jump into another journey because the first one didn't do it. So, I, or it was so good that I, I need to get more insights or have to go back to the well. For the clinician, uh, certainly there are challenges that align with some on the left, but for us balancing uh, our knowledge or pre-existing knowledge with still the beginner's mind and helping facilitate someone's own exploration of their answers and their interpretations, not jumping quickly into offering our interpretations, even if eventually that may be helpful, but we don't want to shortchange the person's own work in, in that process and make assumptions there. 
working with our own disappointments. I know Mary talked about this in her presentation in this series about initially having this idea that everyone's got to have that, that full mystical experience. And that's what healing is all about. And if they didn't get that, then hopefully they'll get it the next time. But having some trust that whatever came up was what was meant to come up and it was still workable and important. Navigating spiritual emergencies, which may look like in, in more of the extreme sense um, and use of this, this phrase, may look like in our Western psychiatric mindset, a psychotic break, right? How to support someone in that, uh, in ideally a destigmatizing way, but helping clarify what's really going on for them. This can look like uh, everyday existential crises and quarter life crises that many of us face and just being in the world and all the things going on and the decisions we're having to make. So helping with that. And then the pacing already referenced uh, when there's impatience. So using any of the genuine authentic energy and uh, lessons or messages, but planning for that if you are going to make a career change or a change in your relationship, giving space before response uh, for a final decision is often helpful. So another way of looking at the diversity of integration journeys, um, there's this idea that goes around in media and, and even professional circles that each psychedelic has their own um, personality. Or you, if you do mushrooms, this is what the experience is like. If you do ayahuasca, this is what it's like. If you're doing 5-MeO, you're going to space automatically. And these are vast generalizations that I really want to step back from because again we don't want to reify and we want to recognize that there is a range of experience even with the same person or with the same medicine over time so it's relational the experiences it's the medicine and it's all the different factors at play the substance itself the dose critical the set meaning the mindset of the person even even the guide the setting that they're doing it the time in their life, all these factors play a role. And as such, the integration process can be quite different. So I'm going to mention very briefly a few examples. Um, this first one, I especially love uh, this, this phrase, poetic bypass, that she coined. But she came into therapy. One of the, the key areas of focus was confronting death and grief. And her experiences are outside of my work with her because um, I only work in above ground context. Uh, and life narrative work was the real focus of the treatment, providing a space where she could share things and we can revisit different parts of her life and situate them into the overall story as it's still unfolding. And a big part of this process that has been healing and re-energizing with life is rekindling creative self-expression. So this poetic bypasses her writing poems, bringing them to the session, sharing them. Um, they're really impressive, articulating things and such nuance, sometimes bringing in the poems of other people. So this is part of the integration work. Another example is making a mindful career change. So this is someone that was dealing with significant burnout in their tech job and uh, isolation socially, definitely amplified by the pandemic in the early days, years, months. And they went on a journey and had uh, very powerful mystical experiences on mushrooms <clears throat> years ago and then started seeing me for integration work. And they've incorporated uh, meditation, a lot of this on their own, uh, journaling, reading a lot of psychological and spiritual material um, and integrating that in, into their intellectual understanding, but also their practice in life. And they made the choice gradually over time with a lot of thought and consistent work to change careers to become a therapist in training and they're in that program now. So that's a beautiful example of how to make such a change mindfully. 
Uh, another one I like to highlight, this is someone that I've done some ketamine assisted psychotherapy with, but has also done things outside of my work with them. And one of the core issues have been somatic symptoms uh, of unclear origin, especially some pain uh, around the vocal cords. And part of the hypothesis that we've explored is whether there's a symbolic le level of uh, the need to give voice to some of the emotions that are more difficult, painful to feel and to express. There's definitely some histor historical influences on that. And recently, the integration work has been to help him do so by imagining different parts of himself holding these different motivations, these e emotions, and dealing with some inner conflicts. Uh, but imagining instead of it being polarized or in arguments where one person wins, one part wins or another part wins, imagining a respectful dialogue of all the different parts and a good faith negotiation. So all of this, of course, is supported in this context with an authentic therapeutic relationship. So and despite the challenges and complexities I've already referenced, you know, this idea of saying yes to a journey, to, to not giving up and embracing some of that uh, is, is very valuable. And I appreciate this quote by Joseph Campbell. It's important to live life with the experience and therefore the knowledge of its mystery, of your own mystery. The big question is whether you're going to be able to say a hearty yes to your adventure. So let's go into the resources. So these are examples, broadly speaking, I think there are three types, self-guided, community-based and offered resources and professional. And quickly go through these. Some of the subtypes of self-guided can be free form. It's whatever the person feels called to do and that they do. Uh, then there are some workbooks that are written to be self-guided or uh, complementary to these other resources. So some of this may look like personal journaling, uh, media, YouTube videos, some workbooks include my book, Beyond the Narrow Life, and Psychedelics Today have a, a couple of journals um, that are a bit more emphasis on the free form that are good. From the community, we have peer-led integration circles, and there are a lot of local uh, circles and now online circles. Uh, so San Francisco Psychedelic Society is one example for us locally in the Bay Area. There's Fireside Chat, which I know uh, Hanifa gave a presentation recently. So that's a wonderful resource that's expanding. And that's the number that people uh, can call. And I, I've had clients call them and receive some support, which has been great. There are various religious spiritual communities. Psychedelic Sangha is a Buddhist oriented community based in New York, has some events out in San Francisco, but it's a lot online now too. Santa Daime, UDV are in America, some ayahuasca churches. Professionally, we have all the various mental health professionals. Psychedelic support has a directory of people who do legal above ground work in this area. That's just one example. Spiritual care providers, uh, psychedelic chaplains are now uh, popping up. And so that, that's a wonderful um, combination and highly relevant. There are trained coaches. When someone doesn't need a higher level of care from a mental health provider, these may be options. Uh, an example of a resource here is the Guild of Guides started uh, by my European colleagues. Uh, and so that's one directory too for these last two categories. For folks who want to read about psychedelic integration from a more professional standpoint, I do definitely recommend Mark's book. It's a great overview and explores, it uses even more metaphors than I've introduced and gives a lot of case material. So it's a good thorough book for professionals interested. For my work in this, uh, I thought it'd be helpful to hear a little bit of the, the behind the scenes perspective about my book and what 
helped me in my perspective and building a narrative for integration. So I started from this place really focusing on what makes psychotherapy helpful in general. And there's research on the common factors of psychotherapy, what supports positive outcomes. And that's having a shared understanding of the core problem between the client and the therapist, collaborative decision-making, the quality of the therapeutic alliance I already alluded to. This can include things like a sense of attunement, mutuality, and authenticity. And then within our world of um, short-term treatment and research, manualized cognitive behavioral therapy and a lot of variations of this, uh, they have strengths in really focusing on the, the structure, the linearity, the, there's a focus of the psychotherapy. It's not so open-ended. There's a focus on generalizability. So what works for most people most of the time, psychoeducation skills, homework, their symptom reduction is the treatment target and the huge benefits are scalable and short-term. On the other side of the spectrum, I think about depth and transpersonal approaches. Uh, so this is emphasizing complexity, nonlinearity, breadth and depth, because there's time uh, to do all of that. There's a valuing of individuality and personality. It's highly relational, exploratory, emphasizes symbolic. And there's an inclusivity of the psychological growth. And I added in play, too, uh, as part of that. It's intensive, expensive, and long-term. So that, that's not very scalable unfortunately, and thus has definite access to care issues. So the question I had is, is there any way that we can help transcend this conflict? Because these may be opposites, but Jung gave me some encouragement from this in a letter he wrote to a, a colleague who actually was asking him about his views on psychedelics. He says, the psyche lives in as much as it splits and unites again. There is no energy without opposites. The opposites are united by a neutral or ambivalent bridge, a symbol expressing either side in such a way that they can function together. So this idea of transcending the opposites was an inspiration. So some parallels when I heard about preparation, experience, integration of the three phases. I immediately thought of the hero's journey. I already referenced Campbell earlier and his mythic framework of there being three phases of the hero's journey, departure, initiation, the trials and boons and the return. And the benefits of this parallel and connection I think is that it does help with the bridge from the mental health treatment to personal development. It bridges psychological to metaphysical if someone wants to have those interpretations of the work and it can help bridge the personal and the collective. There is more of an emphasis, I feel, in a variety of relationships and mythic journeys. So the role of mentors, of allies, one's broader community and foils, even the people who are different uh, than us. Warnings along the way are embedded in these stories and in the myths. And if the myth in this framework is alive, it's, it's a living myth, it's constantly evolving and being retold in different ways from a lot of different perspectives, even in ways that if we're rigid, it can feel opposite. And that's important and meaningful. It's highlighting messages that we need to hear more of today, um, maybe about AI, for example. So parallels here, hopefully that's not too much of a leap, but I still felt like it was a leap with manualized CBT. But some of the functions of that or, or parts of that is consent and psychoeducation. Uh, the medicine is a bit more like the skills acquisition exposure for sure. And then the integration being the ongoing practice and maintenance. Jung again emphasized like there could be a neutral bridge or something that could help bridge some of these frameworks. And a framework that I feel is relatively neutral, uh, at least in emphasizing some of its themes is uh, these existential themes. So focusing on agency and awareness as, as part of this bridge from choice, departure to consent, existential hopes and fears, part of the medicine work and the exposure and the responsibility being a key theme of integration. So my alchemical synthesis, the goal was to provide a guided exploration of psychedelic inspired themes that was readable. I used conversational language 
um, in contractions. I broke all those rules from academia. I keep the big questions front and center because I, I don't think we, we should talk down to anyone where we all can ask these questions. Uh, there's an emphasis on personalization and the agency and creativity. Can stand alone, psychedelics are not required. That was important to me. Can serve as a resource for therapists, coaches, clients, um, and a catalyst for deeper work or, or more personalized work. Some of the features, examples, illustrations, uh, experiential and reflective activities, including some multimedia options. So the three struct uh, phases, the what I call arcs in the book, are as such. First, expanding awareness. Second, confronting trials of initiation. And lastly, integrating the capital S self and beyond. The, I came up with metaphorical allies, attitudes that are beneficial, especially for each of these phases. And those are curiosity, acceptance, and wisdom. I'll quickly mention these nine features. So I try to keep the structure largely the same um, as we uh, go into some deeper topics. So there's self-reflections check-in, the core chapter content. I have simple specific exercises for each arc that's tailored to the themes to function as a break too in between chapters. And those are interspersed throughout. So an example for the trials phase is a sentence completion task. So having a sentence stem and then answering yourself what comes to mind. This translation to everyday life, I like to give some examples of how someone might apply it, knowing that there are many, many infinite ways even. A de-identified psychedelic journey report, a summary to help situate where we're at in the journey and where we're going, and where we've been, where we're going. Uh, lists a curated menu of options to practice and explore between chapters that people can choose from. There's a meditation um, that I created for each chapter, or adapted for each chapter, and then finally a journal prompt. So influential to me, uh, and this is not exhaustive, but are also helpful sometimes being research in psychedelic psychotherapy in modern times are a few different frameworks existential therapy, that's probably no surprise to anyone by this point um, now. And that's exploring and articulating shared fears, conflicts, and concerns in various protective and defensive ways that we can deal with those. That applies to all of us. And some of these themes are facing mortality and loss, loneliness, freedom, um, in the context of uncertainty, especially meaning and meaninglessness. The emphasis is on agency, authenticity, and engagement in life. Acceptance and commitment therapy is a, a nice, more modern approach that has integrated a lot of different areas of influence. And uh, the idea is that our efforts to control our inner experience, our subjective experiences, sometimes, if not always, but at least sometimes, can become the problem itself. And so the treatment target is through various avenues, increasing psychological flexibility. Part of those the avenues to explore include mindfulness um, practices, mindful awareness, not just meditations, and a clarification and expression of personal values. Internal family systems, uh, thinking about the psyche is having many parts of a greater whole and that there are different roles that some of these parts can take on. The manager parts are ego, firefighters, the emergency response team, when we feel like um, painful parts like the exiles or shadow come up. And then this idea of the capital S self, the organizing principle, the part of our self that sees the big picture and can help mediate and connect us. And then cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Um, that there is some benefit of structured activities and skills and worksheets. Uh, having a focus, being goal-oriented in some sense can be very handy and, and drilling down to what's most important and where we need to devote energy at this time. And then this idea of like catalyzing through therapy or other modes, catalyzing healthy change versus needing to be present for the entire change process for a person. 
So this, uh, again, even with all these ideas, these theories and techniques, how do we keep wonder alive? And I'll quote Jung again, our psyche, which is primarily responsible for all the historical changes wrought by the hand of man on the face of this planet remains an insoluble puzzle and an incomprehensible wonder, an object of abiding perplexity, a feature it shares with all nature secrets. So in conclusion, I, I want to highlight again in the importance of recognizing our interconnectedness and our embeddedness in the world and cultivating right relationship, whatever that may mean um, for us as individuals or the people we work with. This is a, a model just highlighting part of our embeddedness, moving from our individual selves, going up to our local networks, um, our shared humanity to Earth, the solar system, galaxy, and the cosmos in its vastness. And not forgetting any part of this embeddedness is a challenge, part of building that uh, cathedral or temple. This is a model I won't get into the details of um, for the sake of time, but it was actually originally articulated and created by Timothy Leary before he became um, a psychedelic evangelist uh, and later in his life. But it's a really nice way of articulating just two factors and that are dimensions and how we present ourselves and our personality, but also how interactions can go amongst us and with our relationships with other people, with the environment. And these factors are dominance versus submissiveness and warmth and hostility. And then when we act in certain ways, we pull from our partners that we're communicating with, we're relating to, to respond in a complementary or congruent way too. So just recognizing that as a back and forth process in a dance, I think is helpful. Shadow work is thrown around a lot and I'm glad it is but it's helpful to clarify a little bit about what we mean about the shadow. Um, first, everything and everyone has a shadow, I'd say always. You don't check this one off your bucket list of doing a shadow work. The shadow is the parts of ourselves that we are uncomfortable with, we're unaware of, um, that we may undervalue or devalue or we feel is dangerous. And Jung even called it a moral problem, that it's not just that all of that's hunky-dory when um, doing shadow work. Shadows exist at every level, the personal, cultural, and collective. And it involves um, a few different things, if I were to break it down. First, it's just cultivating awareness that the shadow exists, that there are parts of ourselves we don't know or understand or that make us very uncomfortable, that we want to keep secret. And by the very fact of keeping them secret or not wanting to have them in our awareness or not wanting to express them, we can project them onto other people. And that is kind of the default position. And this leads to things, I would say it's a big part of polarization and racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, et cetera. And so we unfortunately see the impact of these things in our modern life and really throughout human history. And another part of shadow work is accepting complexity, not oversimplifying ourselves, others, the world. Some of times it's a harm reduction approach um, and a negotiation again with these different parts of ourselves and the different parts of other people. As psychotherapists, healers, mental health providers though, I think we are and should be held to a bit of a higher standard to do our work. It's, that's different than being perfect, but we need to be very mindful and think through the, the ethics of any of the work that we do and the complexity that we hold, including of ourselves. And so some attitudes that are helpful in this is cultivating a sense of courage and humility, right? That's what the shadow I think leads us to oftentimes is that humility is honest in many ways, but it can connect us too. And I love this quote by Joanna Macy, who's a Buddhist teacher. Perfection is not the goal, right? That's, that's the main takeaway. You don't need to be extraordinary. If the world is to be healed through human efforts, I am convinced it'll be by ordinary people, people whose love for this life is even greater than their fear, people who can open to the web of life that called us into being, you can rest in the vitality of that larger body. 
So some other attitudes that I think can be helpful, you can pick and choose, uh, are those three, curiosity, acceptance, and wisdom that I highlighted as metaphorical allies. Respect, I've come to again and again, and that's for anything powerful, and psychedelics certainly can be powerful, but it's respect for ourselves and for others too. Tolerance of ambiguity is part of holding the complexity. Sometimes this is really cultivating an ability to sit with not knowing, especially for those of us who want to understand, who have that intellectual bend, um, or just feel some comfort or safety by having words and models. There's an openness to experience, and this tends to actually be one of the treatment outcomes of psychedelic psychotherapy, including MDMA psychotherapy, according to some of the modern research, and may be a part of the mechanism of action too. We'll see how the data unfolds. Psychological flexibility is key. And there's this quote by the philosopher, Alfred Korzybski, uh, the map is not the territory. That's part of this point I think I'm making here. And Wellwood had this idea of instead of meaninglessness, that sometimes it can be experienced, this ambiguity of meaning, as meaning freeness. And, and that's a beautiful reframe and has some truth to it. The role of compassion plus loving kindness of um, both oneself and others. Sometimes in psychotherapy, we focus a little bit too much on self-compassion in my experience when I hear it spoken about, and it is critical and it's foundational in many ways, but it doesn't end there, right? It's compassion for ourself and others in conversation. And creativity, I've said a lot about already, and discernment. So not from a judgmental place, you know, that could buy into this shadow projection side, but to recognize that life's complex and we do have to have uh, critical thinking at times and it should be balanced, but it doesn't have to come from a place of dismissal, disrespect, fear, hatred, um, but it can inform our ability to make meaningful decisions and choices in life and course correcting if we need. And finally, uh, I like to, to just acknowledge again that metaphor of translation. And apotheosis is that transformative vision of the so-called hero, these mystical-like states where they get a profound sense of perspective, uh, personal insight. Uh, it's a transformative vision, but the hero's journey doesn't stop there. That's actually just even in his model, like towards the second act, towards the end of that. But for us, in moving from any sort of powerful vision, one stopping point might be, how does that inform or connect to our intuitive sense of personal values, our sources of meaning? These are still relatively abstract, if not very abstract ideals. And then from there, translating that into behavior, action, choices, practices, and a frame, a mythic frame for this is creating and embodying our elixir of life. The elixir of life meaning our transmutation of our insights, our personality, our personal experiences, our gifts into something that encapsulates um, some sort of healing or inspiration for not just ourselves, but for our community. So big task, but it's one step at a time. Finally, I like this sage advice from the scholar Houston Smith who did The World's Religion, that book many of you might know. And he was part of the psychedelic world, at least adjacent in the first time that it came up in modern Western American culture um, and saw some challenges with it. And he had a lot of warnings um, when he was being interviewed around 2004 about his thoughts about it reemerging. Um, but ultimately, he summed up his perspective as this. Be cautious, go slow, but do not give up the quest. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Kyle, for that um, absolutely stimulating presentation. So we will turn now uh, to the Q&A. And I'm going to jump in here. Uh, so the model we've looked at tonight, um, 
we have uh, we've heard the word journeying recur, which makes clear that this is a model of of psychedelic experience as a matter of of meaning, a matter of narrative, and, and really a matter of sort of of going somewhere toward new narratives and. I'm struck that that's very consonant with our, our context here as a training series for social workers, where we, we really care about the whole person. We care about the journey as social workers. And I say that to set up what seems to be a real tension that's kind of brewing in the field. You might call it, um, you know, the mystical versus the medical, the mythical versus the medical. Um, and, and the most extreme version of that is really the, the, the biopharma push right now to isolate away the neurobiological effects of psychedelics. Um, with a view that the subjective experience is really more of a side effect in a high efficiency uh, volume model. So if that's the most extreme manifestation of, of where the, the medical model might be heading, I'm curious what that would mean for this sort of mythological and archetypal journey model you've laid out. And I'm curious uh, what your emerging thoughts are around an integration um, of a journey model and a psychiatric medical model. That's a real central question as we're trying to you know, explore how these things can be integrated into our Western society and culture in this modern time. And that will also be ongoing, I'm sure, trial and error. I don't think it's any surprise that I'm, I'm not like hugely interested in new novel compounds that don't have any sort of subjective experience or visionary experience. Um, at the same time, you know, I wouldn't be doing this work if if that were just the case. Um, what draws me to this work is because of these more powerful um, mystical-like experiences, even if we have different interpretations of where they come from or their meaning. But I, when I was writing my book, and as I do my work as a psychologist, I highly value just the richness of people's psyches and the world and, and life and the complexity of all of that. And that doesn't require psychedelics to access or to experience. And Jung said he never did psychedelics in his life, but there's definitely powerful visionary aspects to his work. Um, I, I don't, Campbell was aware of this being used in, in some cultures, but it wasn't like he was proselytizing for that either. Um, so when I was writing my book, I was thinking too, like, well, how, what do I think about overlapping circles? Like there are multiple pathways to get to some of these themes, some of the material. Um, and when there are multiple pathways to a similar space, that gives me a bit more confidence in, in that space and, and at least the ability to access it, to explore it, and that each person has a path. So I respect it in the sense that you know, if it helps someone with their depression or it helps in the symptom reduction in a way so that they can um, maybe explore some of these questions about meaning or their connection, responsibility in life, um, these deeper existential questions, connectedness to nature, that's still meaningful, even if it's not, you know, why I got into this work specifically. It's kind of the outcome I'm looking for. So that, that's my thinking about it now at this point. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And um, I'll follow that up uh, with another question here. I think you did speak to this a bit in the presentation, um, but you know, I'll, I'll note that we started uh, this learning series talking uh, in part about um, ketamine, which people will note has uh, kind of more abstract qualities in some ways can, can be less uh, narrative oriented for certain individuals versus some of the other psychedelics. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, I think, again, you did speak to some more of a general relational view already, but I am curious if you have any thoughts around what it means to work with a certain sort of uh, implied narrative structure of a given psychedelic versus another, or if you feel that there are, are ways to tailor this sort of narrative journey approach to a given substance uh, versus another. I used to hold a bit more of those generalizations about different substances too. Um, so when I say that we probably are doing a disservice to um, this field and to these substances and ourselves by doing that, that comes from my personal experience of realizing that ketamine as an example, um, it's, it's one of the more versatile uh, substances in my experience with clients and personally, and that it can lead to these 
mystical-like experiences with their own signature interdimensional space, you know, is a theme that can come up maybe a bit more for people, abstract um, geometry, uh, but at lower doses, it's more akin to an MDMA experience for some people. So there's such a, a wide variety. One of the things that I try to avoid in my work in like a preparation phase or harm reduction work or even integration is not to, to make these generalizations, even if they're based on experiences with others or my own personal experiences, but to just to be open to what happened for the person because I've certainly had every medicine that's the case. Uh, MDMA doesn't always feel like a sense of love and safety and openness, right? Even for the same person in these case studies. So, you know, it may mean it's always in the context of where a person was before, where they're going. Um, so sometimes the content of the session itself is more part of what needs to be integrated into a narrative of one's healing, one's growth. Um, sometimes it's working with a disappointment if it felt like it didn't get to those places that the person wanted. Uh, when it's, you know, questions of like, what the heck was that? Um, this interdimensional space, what do I do with that? Then that's an opportunity for us to really explore with that sense of curiosity and wonder. So it's not previewing like how the story is going to go for a person, but being open to it all. And then over time you weave whatever meaning is there or not there. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, I think that actually ties quite nicely uh, that question of, of weaving in meaning to another question we have here. And so this individual says um, they were told at the MAPS training that several of the study participants reported it was difficult for them to work with their prior therapist after experiencing a psychedelic treatment protocol because the therapist couldn't accept the amount of change that the client was endorsing uh, in such a short period of time after years of not making much progress uh, in therapy. And so this individual is asking, how can we prepare non-psychedelic therapists to work with clients where they are and, and to remain a part of the integration rather than just dismissing uh, these rather radical changes out of hand? Super relevant question. And I think this is part of the big shift that we're having what the series is about too in all these training programs is we're trying to provide more information than was ever out there. In my graduate program, I, I really don't think psychedelics were ever mentioned in my graduate coursework. In my main psychology coursework before, they were mentioned only because LSD damaged DNA. That was the old finding that they were pointing to. Um, but it was in my, my film work that I got exposed to it. So it was outside of mainstream psychology. And I think that is probably true for most people, even in psychiatry, from my friends and colleagues in psychiatry, that it's a gap. And so it may trigger some sense of ignorance and adequacy, like therapists are humans too. So we that's part of the shadow work. We have to recognize what we don't know, be open to it, explore it, and encourage that in others. And that's true for all of us. We can't be an expert in everything. But it's part of this humility of you know, listening to the person that's in our office and what went on for them and what meaning is coming out of it. And it's not about us, um, you know, not being able to help somebody, but sometimes it's the right time and right experience that gives them an aha moment. And it may not be a surprise to the professional that's been working with someone for years what that insight is, but it came at the right time in a different context. But our, our role, I would just encourage those people, like, uh, you know, pay attention to it, acknowledge it, examine it, educate yourself, be open to it, and help celebrate some of these successes. Because if a person had that reaction, then we don't want to interfere with that. Um, we, we want to support it and help them nourish it. Beautiful. Thank you. So, um there's a question uh, around um, maybe what we could call the, the art and the science of integration. And I'm, I'm really curious with you coming from uh, a clinical psych background and, and uh, understanding the, the value of, of randomized control trials, that there's often sort of a question that comes up with, say, psychoanalysis, which is that it's 
it's a model that isn't um, falsifiable in the sense that you couldn't uh, sort of test um, the opposite of a frame of mind that's been purported to be how people are. And I, I'm curious how you do um, reckon with that kind of battle between the art and the science. There's probably a sense that these things are feel good for integration and they can work. And there would be another sort of hard line scientific view that we need to understand the components of integration by falsifying what doesn't work and doing head-to-head -head trials. I'm curious um, how you think about that paradox and what you think future directions would look like for unfolding that art versus the science of a sort of perfected model of integration. This is a core debate in treatment studies of all kinds. This is not just uh, psychedelic work. Um, in, in my research and post-traumatic stress treatments of various kinds, uh, this, this is highly relevant. So I won't get into too much of the technicalities. Um, oh, I'll try not to. But part of what we're speaking to um, is not just the treatment outcome. So most of our randomized controlled trials, that, that's the gold standard in our modern Western science, is trying to remove as much bias as possible, as much as we can, it's not perfect, and to see what works for most people most of the time, that, that generalizability question. But we don't really very often get to the point of being able to identify and articulate and confirm mechanisms of action. So what led to that positive result? We all have theories, CBT, these short-term models have theories about what's helpful. But when we create an RCT and, and we uh, do it, we have a package deal. And then it takes more time, more participants, more money, to research anything that's more sophisticated than just one outcome or even multiple outcomes that are just on a survey. And it is a lot more sophisticated to research various mechanisms of action. And there are probably more than one. There are interactions, individual differences, like this is science. It is scientific, but it's a matter of pragmatics and practicality that we I would love for this research to exist and to have even more evidence to point to, and it's unlikely to happen, um, but it would be valuable. I would update my models and my perspective. I would point and emphasize different things if I had that. Um, but that demonstrates kind of my perspective that, you know, we always have to work at the edge of science if we're doing something in innovative, and we're always working at the edge of science when we're working with individuals, because what works for most people most of the time based on our best data doesn't necessarily tell us the capital T truth for an individual. Fantastic answer. Thank you for that. We have um, a question here from Jace, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which says, um, understanding that every person's integration timeline can be different. In your experience, what's a good average number of weeks of integration when working with a professional, assuming one session a week, and also integrating a specific recent psychedelic journey? That's a good question. I, I think I would start in answering that for someone who is coming to see me um, to get their sense of what timeline they're anticipating is going to be most helpful or relevant. Um, what their integration goals are. And if there are some sort of intermediary short-term ones that that's really what they're wanting to focus on and they want to do, then, then we would agree on a rough timeline, approximate timeline for that. Some people are able and willing and can devote the energy or have a background where they can do a lot of it self-guided. So it can be short-term I'm just going to throw out some arbitrary numbers there. So like five sessions, it could be that short because um, there's other forms of psychotherapy that are that short it can be a lot longer. There may be stages like my initial goals um, for integration is related to more of that stabilization, just kind of getting back into my life or trying to clarify what direction I want to take in my relationship, right? Or my job um, with one of the clients I mentioned, it's been a years long process of making that transition, um, meeting all the requirements to, to apply to grad school, then to, you know, um, interview, then to choose one, then to be in it and be like, whoa, what is all this stuff and um, help along that journey. And that 
that's probably an outlier and certainly is from a public health standpoint because uh, we don't have those resources um, and not everyone has access to that. But uh, yeah, so that's probably an unsatisfactory answer to it. Um, but the articulation of the specific goals and the person's sense of their ability to work on them independently is are big factors in, in that determination. Thank you so much for that, Kyle. Unfortunately, I think we are coming up on time, so uh, we'll pause here, but thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank nice. you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ortigo. We're so happy to have had you here. It was just really, really informative, and I just want to encourage everybody watching to buy Dr. Ortigo's book. I put a link in the chat. Uh, thank you so much. This session will be recorded and available on our website. Um, so for those of you, it's very, you gave us a lot of information, a lot to think about. So I encourage people to revisit it uh, as well. Thank you and hope our paths cross again soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks everybody. Take care.